Hey, welcome back to The Health Bridge. Dr. Patrick Shojai here today talking about skin. The largest organ in our body, uh, there are so many things that happen with skin that we don't really talk about uh, in our kind of common discourse. And uh, today I have Dr. Anthony Yoon with me, who is a plastic surgeon who is trying to teach you how to not need him. <laughs> it's great. He's got a great new book out called The Age Fix, and it's all about how we can live more healthfully and treat our skin uh, with other kind of ways other than surgery to look healthier and younger. Doc, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, great to see you. Uh, you know, I love I love when uh, guys like you break ranks and basically <laughs> write books about how to do. Uh, you know, like if you go to a, a carpenter, all you see is a nail type of thing, and a lot of surgeons kind of stay siloed in where they're at. Um, you wrote a book about how to do things. You know, so on the cover it says twenty treatments under twenty bucks. You know, that is that is an awesome, awesome proposition for people who are trying to look younger and stay healthy uh, without going under the knife. So uh, before we even get into any of the kind of specifics, how did you end up going there, right? Like you, <laughs> you're a surgeon. Yeah, so I mean, I'm a plastic surgeon. I'm board certified. I've been in private practice for the last 12 years, including my training. I mean, I've been doing this for 17 years or so. And the one thing that is a big fear in my mind, every single day when I walk into the operating room is, is my patient going to die? Is my patient going to die or have a major complication? Because surgery is serious, and and I respect surgery and and how serious it is. And so, really, I think after wor after spending the last twelve years worrying about my patients every single day, I thought, you know, if I could create a, a plan that really anybody can follow to to take off ten years, to look ten years younger, to look the way they want to look without having to go under the knife, then I'll be doing people a, a big service. Amen. Uh, and you know what? The culture that we live in, um, I, look, I'm, you know, in Orange County, so Southern California, right? So Newport Beach, I had a practice right there on the beach and um, kind of like the plastic surgery capital of the world in a lot of ways. And yes. beauty uh, and age and um, self-worth were in, inextricably kind of bound in this really kind of crazy sense of like, you know, I won't be desirable, I won't be able to attract a mate, my mate won't love me anymore, all these types of things. And so uh, there's a lot of kind of subtle psychology with youth and beauty and what that, what that implies. I'm sure you see a lot of that in your world. Yeah, no question. I mean, you know, there's a, a friend of mine who's a plastic surgeon in Beverly Hills and he calls himself a psychiatrist with a knife. And so, I mean, for me, a lot of that, a lot of when I meet my patients, and I'll do maybe six or seven half hour, 45 minute consultations per day, uh, and a lot of it really is trying to find the motivation. You know, where's your motivation? You know, why are you, why are you doing this? And especially when you're talking about surgery and how serious it is and the permanent changes that you can make, you know, once again, it kind of brings me back to, geez, you know, let, let me first get them as healthy as we can get them. Let, let me get their skin as healthy as possible. And then if we get to that point where, geez, they're healthy, they take care of themselves, they're doing all the right things, yet still they have loose skin or still that they're really unhappy with something, then I think it's reasonable at that point, okay, let's discuss surgery. Yep. What are, what are the basics here? Because skin is, you know, like we, I mentioned earlier, it's the largest organ in the body. Uh, you know, there are lots of things. There's lots of, obviously, it's a huge industry. So what mm -hmm. are the kind of basics of being able to take care of your skin prior to even talking about the knife? Exactly. So to put it simply, uh, ideally you want to think of five different things, okay? First thing and most important is to apply sunscreen to your skin every morning. I recommend at least an SPF 30. That's what the American Academy of Dermatology recommends. Because we know that the sun is the number one external aging factor of our skin. And so a broad spectrum sunscreen, at least an SPF 30 is the first thing to do. Second thing is to apply an antioxidant every morning. So our body all day is getting bombarded with free radicals. Free radicals are damaging both their skin and our internal organs. And so to apply an antioxidant cream to our skin can help to prevent that damage uh, and to mitigate those free radicals. Third thing I recommend is to exfoliate your skin two to three times per week if you have normal skin, once a week if you've got sensitive skin. And, and the reason why I recommend that is, you know, when we're younger, we're maybe 20, our skin turns over every six to eight weeks. And that keeps our skin vibrant, smooth, and, and healthy, uh, wrinkle-free. But as we get older, that process slows down. And so exfoli exfoliating your skin can help get rid of that upper layer of dead skin cells and supercharge that process to get you back to that every six to eight week turnover. 
Next thing is to apply an anti-aging anti cream at night. I recommend retinol creams as the first place to start. They're quite inexpensive. You can find retinol creams at the local drugstore uh, at, uh, with major brand names uh, for usually less than $20 or $30. Uh, or you can get the more expensive ones. And the final thing, and uh, very important, that people forget sometimes is you got to wash your face every night, at minimum. Uh, because during the day we get pollutants, we get oil, we get dirt, um, makeup. All of that has to be washed off so that our skin can rejuvenate itself at night. Um, I am guilty as charged being uh, a dumb guy. And, you know, when I first started <laughs> dating, uh, dating my wife, she was aghast at how I would take like the bar of soap in the shower yep, and yep. wash my face with it as well. And I was like, what? Yeah. Right. And so, you yeah. know, guys don't even understand. Like, I, I didn't have any sort of semblance <laughs> of understanding of that. So what, what's what's that? Like, are there special? Uh, I know that there's, you know, face soaps that that are you know, out there on the market. How important is it to use the right kind of soap for your skin? Yeah, so soap is real important. And so just as you mentioned, there's so many guys, especially that use bar soap on their face, they rinse it off, and then they're out the door. And that's the worst thing you can do because bar soap contains surfactants that can strip your skin of its essential oils. So you ideally you want to use a cleanser that is uh, specially made for your skin type. And in the book, in the HFIX, I do, rec I do give a guide to how to find out what type of skin type you have. Because somebody with oily skin should not use the same cleanser as somebody with really, really dry skin. So for example, with oily skin, you want to use a foaming cleanser one that's going to help get rid of, kind of get into those pores, get rid of some of that excess oil. But a foaming cleanser is somebody who has uh, real dry or sensitive skin is not a good idea because that can really strip your skin and make it even feel drier. So, you know, with, with, as with a lot of things in life, one, one uh, type does not work for everybody. And so finding out what skin type you have and then using the cleanser that's appropriate for that can be very, very important to taking care of your skin. There's so much stuff on the market, it, it, it's dizzying. And so everyone's yes. got this, you know, it's like the ancient Chinese secret. It's like, oh, no, 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 you know, my girl just gave me this cream. This is the cream, you know, it's $300 for a little spot of this. And people swear by this stuff. Um, and it's, to me, it's wild, wild west, right? There's some science, yep. there's some just kind of crazy, like fad, yep. someone got a good publicist. Uh, how do we make sense of all the crap on the market and what's the good stuff? Yeah, so in skincare, you don't necessarily get what you pay for. And that's where kind of those five things I mentioned earlier are super important, you know. So, you know, there are all these creams that they recommend that, you know, a company says, oh, this is the, the better than Botox. No, this one's better than Botox. Um, so you want to look at, once again, the sunscreen, real important. The antioxidant and, and vitamin C is the most commonly used antioxidant. Make sure if you get a vitamin C serum or a cream that it's in a container that keeps out sunlight, okay? So if you get one and, and it's in a clear container, bad idea, uh, because the vitamin C will degrade very quickly with sunlight. And if you, if you have a vitamin C antioxidant cream and you pull it out, you squeeze it out and it comes out brown, it has oxidized, so it's not gonna be quite as effective. Um, as far as exfoliating, you know, there are, you can buy exfoliating scrubs, you can um, use a Clarisonic type device, um, or you can actually make your own at home. And I do give a recipe uh, in the HFIX book about how you can actually whip one up using baking soda, uh, reduced fat milk, and some honey. And that way you can use all natural ingredients. Now where it really kind of gets down to the nitty gritty are the anti-aging actual creams, okay? And what works better? Copper peptides, growth factors, retinol. And what I recommend for my patients really and for the readers of the book is to start with a retinol type of cream. Okay, retinol is a form of vitamin A. And I'd say if you ask dermatologists and plastic surgeons, probably 70 to 80% of them would recommend a vitamin A based cream as an anti-aging cream over any of the other ones because it's the most scientifically proven. Start with that and if your skin doesn't tolerate it or you're not getting what you want, then I would progress from that to growth factor based creams. And if that's not it, then you can go with a peptide. But peptides are probably the least proven of those groups. Got it. Um, this is the external stuff. What about what we yes. eat? That, I mean, there's obviously a, a huge kind of conversation around having, you know, good fats and, you know, X, Y, and Z. What's, <laughs> what's the diet that someone needs to eat so that you kind of radiate from the inside out? Yeah, and you're totally on the mark because really what we eat can really strongly make a major impact on how we look and how, and how our skin ages. And I've seen this in a lot of my patients. You know, people who come in and, and they say, you know, you can tell by literally when they walk in the door, 
if they're a fast food junkie because the skin is oily, it's, it's um, more wrinkled, it doesn't have a, that radiance to it. So the first thing that I recommend to my patients in the first part of the HFIX diet is to limit the amount of sugar. Now, you know, you've interviewed a lot of uh, nutrition experts and you've heard this before. Um, and so we know about the dangers of sugar. Um, but what, what people haven't as, you know, talked about as much is just how sugar can make an impact on how we look on the outside too. Now we know that it can contribute to weight gain and, and, and uh, various um, health issues, but it can actually make your skin look older. And it's mainly two processes that do it. So sugar spikes cause insulin spikes and that, cause in, that causes inflammation. And that's something that you've reported on you know, with a lot of the other authors and things. Um, and so that chronic inflammation can be very bad for our skin. It can increase our risk of breakouts and cause our skin to age more quickly. But there's also the process of glycation. And glycation is a process where the sugar molecules will actually bond to the collagen and the elastin in our skin. Now the collagen and the elastin in our skin are the building blocks of our skin. And when that sugar bonds to the collagen and elastin, it, it causes it to become deformed and that can cause our skin to age prematurely. So it's those two processes. It's the inflammation and the glycation that, that is the main reason why sugar can be horrible for our skin. When someone comes in saying, hey, listen, you know, I want you to cut my face, um, uh, yeah, it's gone too <laughs> far, um, how long does it take? Like you, you say, okay, wait, hold on, slow down, let's, let's try some diet, let's try some supplements, let's try this, that, and the other. How long do you typically wait before you, you see if the results have kind of come in and, and, and they can start seeing some, some difference in what you're recommending? Yeah, unfortunately, if people come in and they have cash in hand, they want an immediate change and uh, only surgery can get that type of an immediate change. Um, with, the pro with the food, with especially the products, um, even the most aggressive um, prescription strength skincare products like, like prescription strength Retin-A, like prescription strength Hydroquinone, they do take a minimum of six to eight weeks to really see your results. Mm. So I usually recommend give it at least three months. See what you can do, okay? Now there are certain things that, that eating foods and applying things to your skin isn't going to treat, you know. So, for example, if somebody says, "Look, I've got so much extra skin in my eyelids that it's hanging down. I can't see very well." Well, it doesn't matter what food you eat; that skin's still going to be a problem. And in those cases, you know, surgery really is the best option. Yep. Um, but I've had so many people that come to see me and they say, "I just want to look ten years younger. How can I do that?" And when you look at them and their skin really is kind of a mess, that's always for me the first place to start. Yeah, there's a challenge. What do, you, what do you got for dark circles under the eyes? I mean, I've, I've fought with this my whole life. Um, yep. I actually went on a run, uh, of an infamous run at this at one point with no sunblock on and burned under my eyes over like years back. And yep. um, it's yep. one of those things that, is, I mean, that's, that's you know, the, the place where you, we see it the, the, the fastest on some people, <clears throat> especially Middle Eastern types. Yep. So what you got to look at with dark circles under the eyes is the treatment needs to be, um, needs to be focused at the cause. So there are three main causes of dark circles under the eyes. Your cause may be different than others. So the first thing is pigment. So if you've got darker skin, um, Indians, African Americans, Asians, a lot of them can get pigment that deposits right in kind of that the under eye area and that pigment can, really can only be treated with skin lightening creams. Uh, naturally, some people there's a cream called tiamine that's more of a natural type of a thing that's made from tea leaves and things. Um, if you're looking at something more um, uh, more potent, uh, we use hydroquinone in the office for short periods of time to help decrease that, that darkness. So dark circles are treated, if it's from pigment, with the pigment lightening creams. Uh, over the counter, there's niacinamide creams. Some people will even apply uh, licorice root extract over the area. And, and give, if you apply licorice root extract over it, uh, typically twice a day, you give it a couple months, you may see that lightening. Well, the second cause of dark circles under the eyes is thinning of the skin. So in Caucasians, people with lighter skin, especially that skin under the eyelids is the thinnest skin of our body. And it can get so thin that it can become transparent and you can start seeing the dark color of the blood vessels underneath. Mm -hmm. So for those people, typically lighter skin people where they've got the dark circles there, the darkness, um, you can see it's kind of more of a purplish color that's from the veins underneath. And the ideal situation is to thicken that skin. And the ideal cream for that is a retinol cream. So there are retinol-based eye creams, and they're not too expensive. Once you can find these at the local drugstore, 
that can help gradually thicken that skin. Once again, can take a few months, but that's the way to go if that's the issue. And the final cause of dark circles under the eyes is puffiness. And that's where people have quote unquote bags. Uh, in that situation, it's actual fat. And that fat can only be treated surgically. So those are the patients that we consider surgery for, a blepharoplasty. We can now do that without any visible scar by making a little incision on the inside of the eyelid. Um, I'd say about 50% of people don't even get bruising from it, so a very simple procedure. But for those people who don't want surgery, I give a nice tip in the book. Uh, there are topical creams that you can apply that act kind of like a shrink wrap for that skin. And they typically work for a few hours. The easiest, least expensive one is one called Sudden Change. You can find it at most drugstores. It's about $15. You apply it on, underneath the eyelid, on the eyelid skin, and that can help tighten it up. Uh, it's not an anti-aging miracle or anything like that. It lasts for a few hours. You want to combine it with good anti-aging creams as well. Um, but that's one way that, that can temporarily tighten that skin too. Love it, love it. Thank you. I, lo I love getting my little, like personal plug in there. Um, it's like, hey, Doc, <laughs> tell me what's up. Um, so you mentioned something called improving your portrait um, in your book and uh, eyes, nose, skin, and ears. What specifically are we talking about here and what are the concerns that, that people come in with when, when you look at them and say, okay, look, let's, let's, let's look at this differently? Yeah, I mean, there's so many things to consider and, and when, you know, we always start off with the, the skin and that's kind of when we talk about, okay, your face is like a painting, uh, the skin is like the canvas, okay? So we always want to make sure there's a good canvas there by taking good care of the skin. But we also have other issues that people come up with. You know, people say they don't like a bump on their nose or they feel like um, they don't like how round it is or they've got acne issues. Um, or, or as we get older, we lose fat in our face and our fat gets thinner. Um, there's so many things that we deal with. And so in the book, what I try to do is give non-surgical uh, approaches for as many of these as we can treat. Um, now in plastic surgery, technology has been great for us, you know, and, and I have this article that I'm writing about how technology is kind of the new fountain of youth nowadays. Uh, and we have treatments that use ultrasound that can tighten up the skin under our neck and, and hopefully avoid a, a facelift. Uh, we've got other treatments um, like IPL, intense pulse light, that can get rid of, um, of the sunspots that we get as we get older. And so it's trying to kind of find these non-surgical ways to treat aging problems that may have been treated surgically in the past. Amazing. Yeah, I mean, we've come a long way, and you know, to to <clears throat> not use the tech where we can is is absolutely foolish. What do you think of a red light? I mean, there's some uh, f uh, infrared, far infrared. I've looked at, and there's some some of these masks that are coming out that that boost collagen. Uh, any, yeah. any promise there? Yeah, you know, we have been using LED and red light type um, devices in dermatologists and plastic surgeons offices for many years. Mm -hmm. And there is this trend now towards uh, at-home devices as well, you know, basically at-home laser devices. Uh, probably the most popular ones are actually the ones for hair removal. So laser hair removal, you know, are still done in most uh, plastic surgeons, dermatologists offices, but you can actually buy, there's several different brands online that you can purchase that really do work to remove unwanted hair from different parts of the body. And those are great for those people who, you know, they can't spend a thousand dollars on a series of laser treatments in a doctor's office, but they may, for them it may be a splurge, but they can afford, let's say, $250 for a device that they can do at home and use it for as long as they want. Are they effective? Now with these at home, they are, yeah. Now it, it does take more treatments. Uh, you have to do the treatment yourself, so you can't just lie there and have somebody else do it for you necessarily, mm -hmm. um, but they do, they do tend to work. In the end though, you have to um, match your expectations with what these products can do. And so an at-home LED device, and there's one that I mentioned called FaceFX, which I think is really nice, a couple hundred dollars, you buy them online, and they can help to rejuvenate the skin similar to what kind of like a lunchtime laser we can do in our office. So I do think that these devices are very helpful. We have ones for acne now, there's the ones for aging, there's the ones for hair removal, and probably the most exciting actually are the ones that you can use for hair loss. So uh, men and women who are having thinning hair, tons of studies have shown that using low light laser therapy can help thicken hair that has gotten thinner. And uh, it used to be kind of this funny gadget where it was a laser comb where people would comb it through their hair. There's actual real science showing that that works. And now they even have a laser cap that's like, a, it looks like a baseball cap, but you turn it inside out and you can actually see tons of lasers on the inside, you put it on your scalp for several minutes a day, 
and science does show that it helps to regrow hair that's thinning. It doesn't help if it's if the person is bald. You know, if they've got actual bald spots, it's not going to grow hair there. But for those people who are thinning, is it's great for them, and they do it at home, so nobody knows that they're having it done. So you have a functioning follicle, you can use it and basically thicken the, thicken the hair. Yeah. So the idea is that it helps those follicles that are in the kind of quiescent stage, the telogen type stage, the antigen stage, to start growing. And it, and it helps them to get into that growth phase uh, so that more hairs are growing uh, versus in kind of that phase where they just sit dormant. Yep. Yep. Fascinating. I had a guy in here the other day, actually, like, he had this little like microscope sensor on his laptop. It was uh, one, of, one, of, one of the guys on our team. He used to be a hair growth guy. He's showing me all this hair I have on my head. He's like, man, we uh -huh. could turn this around. Like, I don't know if I care, but... Uh, I was like, look, you have plenty of hair on your head. You just need to, you know, uh, give, it, give it a little love. And I, and I think that it's kind of trying to get that happy medium of, you know, we all, we all want to feel good about how we look, right. but we don't necessarily all want to go under the knife. And I think it's, it's healthy to be, to be happy with our appearance because in the end, usually our appearance has to do with our health, you know. And so in the book I mentioned, you know, that being healthy really is probably the best way to look younger. You know, and, and that's one of the things I really tried to promote with it. Amazing. Yeah, I mean, that's it. Like, you, you can see beauty radiate from the inside out. If someone just came off a run and their face is glowing red with, with you know, just blood flow. Yeah. And it, you, you can see health that is actual health. And then people who are trying to, uh, you know, masquerade health um, by, by, you know, cutting and pasting. Uh, and makeup and, yeah. Yeah, it's a challenge. So. What, what about the other side? There's myths, there's misinformation. I mean, it's such a weird industry. Uh, what, what do our listeners or viewers need to know about just kind of the crap that's out there? Yeah, so um, there's a lot of little, I have a chapter in the book about myths and plastic surgery and, and a lot of things that people think might work and don't. Uh, just, there's, and these are kind of silly, kind of fun little things to an extent. Uh, for example, uh, there is this kind of idea that um, if, uh, if you sleep on your face, it can cause wrinkles. Uh, and technically, that's true. Uh, now, if, let's say, you're just super tired one night, and you, you, you jump in, you fall into bed, and you're asleep in a second, and you wake up, and you've got crease lines on your face, those aren't going to stay long term. But if you are somebody who sleeps on your face night after night after night, you wake up with those creases, those creases eventually will stay there. Uh, and it's the same thing as the creases of our face. You know, we keep making certain faces, uh, and expressions, and those creases will eventually stick around. So one thing I recommend to people, if, you know, if you can't, let, if you, if those creases bother you and you can't not sleep on your face, is to get a silk or a satin pillow, a pillowcase, because that's going to be a bit softer than cotton or polyester, uh, and that's going to help decrease some of those sleep lines and, and slow down that process. Uh, another kind of funny little thing that you may have heard of is applying Preparation H under the eyes to decrease puffiness. And this is kind of the old red carpet secret. Uh, years and years ago, they say that celebrities would do that. Um, well, first of all, it's, this is obviously is not meant for the under eyes. It's meant for a different part of our body. So you shouldn't apply it there anyway. Um, but they do say that the active portion of that Preparation H was removed from the US version long ago. Some people think that Canada, the Canadian version of Preparation H, still has it. Um, and so if you do want to use Preparation H under your eyes, I guess you'd need to go to Canada to get it. <laughs> um, but that's where we're using some of these other products that I mentioned in the book, like the Sun Change, where you know it's a quick tightening under the eyes for those people who, let's say, have an event like a date or a reunion, um, you know, a wedding to go to. You apply those types of products, you get that temporary change for a few hours, you know, and then by the time it wears off, the event is over. Mm -hmm. That's really funny. The fact that people are putting preparation age on their eyes just makes me chuckle. <laughs> well, it's the celebrities. That's the funny yeah, thing. Yeah, know? yeah, yeah. I think they could afford something different, but go figure. Whatever it takes, right? Whatever it takes. So yeah. we, we have this concept of aging. And so, you know, you're, you're talking about like aging gracefully, right? Um, look, we're all, we're all going to be aging. So the question isn't yeah. about anti-aging. It's such a weird concept. And, and, you know, people are trying to find this fountain of youth. Uh, you know, the years go on, stuff changes. So how, how do we look at this in a much more holistic, kind of healthy way? Yeah, you know, the way that I talk to my patients about it is, you know, we have to all accept that we're aging. I have so many people that come to see me and they're really distraught about how they're, how they're getting older and they can't accept that they're going to have more wrinkles. You know, they literally want 
me to make them look exactly like they did 20 years ago. And it's just not possible. So I try to tell my patients, you know, really is that, you know, getting older is a blessing. You know, with every birthday I have, yes, I don't like the fact that, you know, I'm going to turn 44. But I'd much rather turn 44 than not. And so I try to instruct my patients, like, look, you know, getting older is a blessing for us. You know, if we weren't getting older, then it would, then we'd be in our grave. Um, however, to to fight the aging process, as long as it's reasonable, you know, as long as you're not doing, you know, terrible things to yourself, it is good. Like, if you want to fight the aging process and and kind of, you know, look as good and as healthy as you can, by all means, do that. You know, by all means, eat the right food. By all means, apply those anti-aging creams to your skin. Play around with it. Have fun with these different creams. See which ones work for you. And if you want to try a little bit of Botox or a little laser treatments or whatever, then by all means go for it. You know, where I get a little concerned, obviously, is when we deal with surgery. Because that's not playing around with the cream on your skin. That's a whole other story. And that's where I really kind of put the brakes. And yes, I do operate on people, and I operate on people several times a week, but I'm very, very cautious with who I operate on because. Once again, you know, that's where, where people can really go over the edge and you can get some major problems. So, so that's kind of the way that I, I approach it is, you know what, getting older is a blessing. We're all going to get older. We're all going to see that aging. We have to accept that. But, but to, to, to fight that process and to have fun doing it is a blessing for us as well. You got these people, and, and you know where I live. There's a lot more um, than than normal. Is you know these kind of these chronic surgical cases, and they've just been getting surgery for like the last 10, 15, 20 years, and it's just become uh, it, it is it's become a psychological thing. Uh, when when people like that come in your office, I mean, do you, do you send them for a psych consult? Like, how do you even deal with that? Saying, look, listen, there's nothing I can do to actually fix this. Um, you know, I'm sure this guy's down the road that'll take their money, but um, you know, what, what, what happens there? Well, there's a number of issues here. Uh, the first thing is that there are a number of people that are affiliated with body dysmorphic disorder, body dysmorphia, where what they see in the mirror is not the same thing that you or I would see. So for example, you know, this person may have a small bump on their nose, and you or I would look at it and say, oh look, there's a small bump, no big deal. To them, that bump is the size of Mount Rushmore, and they can't understand why other people don't see how deforming that is. And so they go to see a plastic surgeon, and maybe this plastic surgeon uh, doesn't have anybody on their surgery schedule that week, and they go, oh, it's a little bump, I'll just take that off, you know, make a little bit of money, why not? So they do that, but unfortunately, that bump, even though maybe it's gone or there's the tiniest hint of it still there, that patient's still unhappy because because their perception of it comes from a completely unrealistic place, okay? From a, it really, it's, it's kind of almost delusional. Uh, and so then they go see somebody else, and that other person says, oh, I don't like that surgeon that, you, that did your nose before. I see a tiny bump there, let me do it. And now that person starts going on this kind of a, uh, a slippery slope of surgery after surgery after surgery to correct a, a defect that wasn't even there in the first place. So that's the first group of people, and, and those, are, those patients are very, very difficult to treat because one hallmark of their psychiatric condition is that they don't have insight into their problem. They literally think that everybody else is wrong and they're right. Just like you and I might look at the sky and say the sky is blue, somebody else may say, no, it's green. Well, we're not going to believe them no matter what they say because we know, we know what we're seeing. So that's the first group. I think the second group of people, and this is kind of a lot in your area, and I've been in L.A. a lot. My, my family lives um, uh, in Orange County, uh, so I'm there a lot. And, and I do think that there is a societal difference in L.A., in, in Miami, a little less so in New York. Um, but I do think it's almost becoming um, the point where having plastic surgery and having a plasticized type of a face is, is a sign of wealth to some people. So it's like you have the fancy car, you have the fancy handbag, um, you have the fancy shoes and you have a face that's puffed up because you know to let people know that you can spend thousands of dollars on fillers you know to, to, to look quote unquote better when really they just look different. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's sad because there's beauty that comes from within and then there's societal kind of you know conspicuous consumption and all these weird things that are that are kind of tied to it which yeah and and society is not kind to women you know it's 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 easy for men to sit around and judge women and say oh look you know look at her lips they look too big and this and that um, but in the end really society is so not kind to women as they get older um, in so many different ways with all the body shaming and, and, and all of that 
um, that that you feel bad for a lot of them because it's like it's they're trying to cling to the sense of youth because I think a lot of uh, women especially um, have have used that as that's kind of where they've developed a lot of their self esteem just because of the way society works so you know it's a bad it's a terrible statement on society but I think that it, it is kind of what we're dealing with now. yeah yeah I mean and I, I think it's accurate you know sadly you know, the graceful aging and your, your worth is only, you know, based on you know, your external appearance, that, that's pretty damn superficial to start with. But I mean, that's what's driven a lot of people into kind of this, this dilemma of, of, you know, kind of personal, you know, cosmetic care and all that. So I love it. I love, I love your message. I love how kind of authentic and honest it is. Uh, the book is called The Age Fix. Um, great cover, by the way. It's very, um, if, Nothing says I was I was written for a woman more than this cover. <laughs> it's just very. It's, it's but we very, have actually a lot of men reading it too. Sure, surprisingly. sure, <laughs> sure. I mean, look, I've I've been flipping through it, and there's a bunch of things in here that I had no idea about. So I'm like, okay, yeah, got it, I got it. Now that I gotta, you know, now that I gotta care, I'm getting in my. Now I'm in my 40s, and these things cool. matter, right? <laughs> well, and that you know, it's not too late to to take care of your skin, and because as we get older, you know, once again, it comes down to um, healthy skin. And so taking care of it, doing those things that I mentioned earlier, the sunblock, the antioxidants, the anti-aging creams, exfoliating and cleansing your skin at least every night. You know, even as a guy, you've got to do it because we all get older. That's it. That's it. Uh, how can people find you? How can people find your book, Doc? Yeah, so the book is uh, on Amazon. It's, it's at bookstores all around the country, Barnes & Noble. Uh, my website is dryun.com, D-R-Y-O-U-N.com. We've got up to six free gifts for people who purchase the book, including the Age Fix bonus book, which is 30 pages of extra information, other tips, tricks, and secrets to look younger. So we'd love to hear from uh, from your readers and your viewers. Love it. Love it. Hey, great. Um, I'm happy there's guys like you doing the work that you're doing out here, and uh, keep it up. And uh, yeah, let's, let's redefine aging and beauty and all these things and have a, a conversation that's a little more holistic around it. And I love the fact that you're doing it. Sounds good. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Yeah, thanks for being here. Uh, Dr. Anthony Yoon, check out the book. Uh, this is Dr. Pedram Healthbridge. I'll see you next week.